Hi everyone, welcome back to the Ask Mike Show. Mike here as your host as always. And today I'm joined with Robert Farrington in the studio. Robert, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So you started the College Investor, which is one of the most popular blogs for financial advice for millennials. But if I'm not mistaken, you were in college when you started it. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah. So I started it when I was finishing up my last year of school and it was kind of the culmination of me and a bunch of passions, right? I've always been passionate about making money. I've been passionate about investing. Uh, I originally went to college to be a computer science major. So I always really liked the technology and, you know, I've been reading other personal finance blogs. And so I, I got that, that little spark, right. That said, Hey, I am just going to try this out. I'm going to do it. I'm going to put my random ideas out into the world. And that was 12 years ago. So it's stuck and uh, I've learned a lot on the way. So what was some of the initial content that you put out then? Cause a lot of people tend to struggle with, if I'm starting, how do I sort of establish myself as such even though I'm just starting out myself yeah honestly I didn't really know what I was doing I'll be totally honest right I just started putting it out there and the content was pretty terrible if you like look back at hindsight it was individual ideas on how to pick stocks it was you know different ways to make money and I realized it was all about like what I wanted to write about which honestly wasn't extremely valuable to people, right? And it wasn't until I wrote a story about my student loan debt. And I wrote how my student loan servicer was messing up my payments and I had to battle their customer service. And it was one of the first articles that went viral for me. And I get all these comments and shares and people were like, me too, I'm dealing with all my student loans. And it was really a light bulb moment for me in terms of, you know, I need to talk about what people are, need help with themselves. And it looks like a lot of people are struggling with their student loan debt and people are struggling to navigate this because, you know, it's a whole system set up not to help you. And so as I started writing more content about what people needed, especially when it came to student loan debt, how to get started, all these things, that's when I really saw an inflection point early on of blog growth, traffic growth, engagement, and so on. So it started from you sharing your story then, which for people listening is a pretty good starting point because a lot of people tend to struggle with, you know, how much do I need to know before I start putting myself out there? That can be a question on a lot of people's minds. But you're saying that your experience with the student loan debt was the main kickstart for you, which from the outside looking in, I can feel like not, a good thing either like it's kind of been a good experience to have that and yet that was what kick-started for you so what are your thoughts on content creation and sharing sharing your losses in some ways because student loan debt wouldn't be described as a win would it no I think that's it I mean people want your story they want to know what you've done. And honestly, you only need, I always like to say, I, I want to coin this from Colbert Bear uh, Bar. He says expert enough, right? You only need to be a little bit more knowledgeable than somebody else, right? So if you've been through a situation, literally write what you've done because there might be someone else that's come along and experiences the same thing. And even though you might not know all the answers as you've navigated it, you will have tips and tricks and different aspects that you know are unique and can also be helpful to people. Um, but then also, if it's something that you're passionate about, that could be the jumping off point. And that's what it was for me, right? I you know shared my story about student loans. And now I would say that I'm probably one of the most knowledgeable people about student loan debt in the United States. And you know, it was a really a jumping off point of how does the system work? What's going on? How can we help people? And, you know, as I've helped people as well, like I've learned, I still learn things today because it's shocking how many unique situations there are. And it's like, oh, wow, that's a new one. And you'll keep learning. And honestly, it, it probably wouldn't be as fun if there wasn't things to learn and see new stuff all the time. Right. It's an interesting point that you bring up, actually. What I'd be curious about is what was the time from the experience to then sharing it? Because some people might have the objection of, well, if I'm in it, 
and I'm not in a good place, should I share it? Or is it more about wait until I have the lesson and the, the takeaway for people? Oh my gosh, it was probably right away. I mean, come on, what does a good content creator do? Is when you're in the moment, <laughs> you have a customer service problem, you go on the computer and you start writing down exactly what is going on. So it was honestly very quick. But that's the other thing I love about the internet, right? We're not writing books here. Nothing we are doing is permanent. So, you know, you can go back and you can edit it. You can add more to it. You can create a part two. You can, depends on your medium. So, you know, uh, I would say put it out there very quickly and then just iterate on the topic, add to it, you know, create more if it, if it hits, right? It's interesting when you post it when it's raw as well. Uh, sometimes from my own experience as well, it's the emotion that actually makes the content sing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. People want that frustration. They, they like to know that they're not the only ones frustrated with whatever you're talking about, right? That makes sense. What about other aspects of content that you think would make better content, not just the same thing that everybody else is posting? I mean, I don't know quite what you mean, but I think like that's where you got to start. So I'm a big believer in the baseball analogy in terms of you have to have the at bats to get better. And so you just have to keep putting out the content and trying, seeing what sticks. But the process also makes you better. And if you don't have all these practice attempts, you're never going to get to the point where you're putting out quote unquote better or good content more regularly, right? Like it takes you trying it. It takes you trying it out there. But again, you can also go back and edit it, change it. So like, you know, if a year from now you look back and you're like, whoa, I wish I didn't do that. Well, you can change it. It's not, you know, a book. It's not permanent. Yeah, that that makes sense in the whole changing what you do element. I quite like the way that you describe it because it's almost like you go from trying to create content to just documenting your journey yeah how have things adjusted for you over the years then because you still blog in a world of video and podcasts like this one and multiple other things happening and yet the blog still sort of stands the test of time almost how have things adjusted for you in terms of not just starting the blog not just growing the blog but it's still being something that you're committed yeah, to. Yeah, well, first off, I think, you know, enjoying the content and enjoying the subject is huge. But, you know, honestly, with that in mind, I, we're trying to be very multi-channel here because I think there's a very large part of the world that just reads, like they are readers. And I'm one of those. So if I had the choice of three identical pieces of content and a, a podcast, a video, and a blog post, I will always go to the blog post. I'm a reader. It's just what I prefer, right? But I think it's like a Venn diagram in terms of like, you know, there's readers and then there's audio and then there's an overlap section and then there's also video. And then, you know, you add that into the, the, the Venn diagram as well. Right. And so there's an overlap between that. And so we are trying to create more content that is cross platform. So we have a, a YouTube channel recently passed 10,000 subscribers. We have a podcast that's over a million downloads at this point in time. Um, and all it is is our exact blog content repurposed into the medium that we're in. Um, and so we have a podcast that basically ad-libs our blog posts, no guests, no nothing, short six to 10 minute episodes, but people love it, right? Because if you're a natural audio person, that's how you prefer to consume your content. And so I think uh, you can still definitely stay relevant and you can do these things. Um, but you know, I also think you need to start someplace first. So for me, I'm a writer, I like to read, that's my native area, but you can add on to these other areas as you grow or, or if that's what you're looking to do. I like how you started with what your sort of natural tendency is and then you sort of go from there. But how do you find what your natural tendency is if you're unsure? You just got to try it. Right. And so honestly, you know, having a little bit of self-awareness is huge, but it also comes with practice. Right. But hopefully, you know, once you're probably 20 years old or so, you should kind of know if you prefer to read, write or listen. Um you know, but then, you know, when it comes to creating content too, it takes practice and maybe you find that you like one thing or the other, but 
try it. Try the at bats, put it out there, see what happens. Um, you know, there's so many options out there today. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not, maybe it's like Instagram, right? Maybe it's just visual, like just picture. I don't know. But that's the cool thing is that we live in this internet day and age where, you know, you can create all kinds of content in all kinds of different mediums um, for pretty much any kind of vertical niche, anything out there, right? There's probably so many things out there we've never even heard of yet, but there's a community around it and you could be doing that for your community. Do you ever feel like stopping the blog and focusing on something else? Because the counter to it is, well, the world is going a particular way and you're in a position whereby you can maximize the opportunity of something that's sort of going that way. So you get ahead of the curve almost versus sticking with the block. But then... You, know, you you probably got some kind of stats to back up the fact that your blog is still doing really well to justify it. So what's your take on moving the way the world is going as such, whether it be video, podcast, whatever it is, versus sticking to something? Because you're in a position where you could probably do both. So how do you make that distinction? Well, I think every content creator, whether you have a blog or not, needs to have their own website. And the reason is, is you need to have your own home base because the world might be on TikTok these days, but you don't own the content on TikTok. You put videos out there, but TikTok could be shut down. Shoot. I mean, even the United States, what, let's look like a year ago, like Trump was threatening to like shut down or block it, right? Like, you know, weird things happen that's outside of your control. But, you know, if you own your own website and you own your own home base, and that could be also newsletter subscribers or whatnot, right? Like if you are on these other platforms and you're at least sending people to your email list or sending people to your website, you know, at least you own that. And so if anything does change, you can take that community that you've built and you can move to something else or whatnot. So I would say you have to do both. You always need to create your own home base as a website or email list or similar um, alongside wherever your native medium is, whether that is a video platform or a podcast or so on. I would completely echo the idea of having something that's yours especially with all the apps that keep popping up all over the place. It's now more than ever. We need to have something that's digital, that's virtual, that's online, that we can also own and call our own. What do you do personally from a a content perspective, whether it's social media or otherwise, that you know moves the needle with, with your blog? Well, it starts with creating the quote unquote best content, like I said, because then everything else falls into place and it's really easy to do the rest of the stuff, right? So when we have a topic idea, you know, we really try to go for, is this the best on whatever we're writing about? Are we covering all the bases? Could we get a quote? Do we talk to experts? You know, like, is there a chart, a graph, anything like that that we can put in to highlight what we're talking about? Like, Because then once you have really, really good content that's not just, you know, the basics, it becomes very easy to share it on social media or email people or reach out and say like, hey, here's this new thing that we created. Um, So that's really what we focus on first is if the content is really amazing to start with, all the rest of it, sharing it, pushing it out to our email list, it feels good because you're proud of what you've created and you know you feel like this is going to add value and be beneficial for your audience. I need to touch on the whole pride thing because creating content or even like services, products, whatever it is that you yourself are proud of, I want listeners to sort of take that and go oh that's really interesting because there's a lot that comes along with that so how do you set your own standards in a way that allows you to create the best that you can something that you're proud of whilst matching you know maybe the high standards might slow you down maybe all that sort of stuff can hinder you potentially but also having that standard can mean everything that you create is automatically world-changing or or amazing. So how do you look at that? 
Yeah, well, first it comes with experience and practice, right? So we never start at the best. Like, again, like we start practicing and we do the best we can at that time. And then as you continue to get better and better, you know, you can elevate your standards, but you also learn as you go. So like what's included? I also just like to look around. Like, honestly, we just need to open our eyes. So like Google, whatever it is you're talking about, go look at the top 10 results of Google and see what other people are doing. Like, you know, I, I'm not saying copy their content, but I'm saying if you're writing something that requires a chart and everyone else has a chart and then you don't put a chart in your content, well, maybe you should create a chart that makes sense, right? Or, you know, maybe it's an image or a graphic or who knows, right? Like th there's just a base level of what everyone else is kind of doing. And so like, you can see that standard and then you can see if you can elevate that standard. So like if everyone else has a great, article but there's no audio or podcast with it maybe that's what you do you add a podcast in right or, or a video tutorial or i saw a, a recently a whiteboard video you know added into an article which i thought was pretty cool someone took the time to create a whiteboard tutorial which you know granted that costs some money and some time but you know it really does elevate that standard and we're all at different levels so if you're starting this as a side hustle as a as, this is your first project you know, you're not probably not going to invest the time or money in that unless you're passionate about it, right? Like that's your jam. But you know, you could create something yourself in PowerPoint. I started with like PowerPoint and Excel charts, and then you you know could screenshot them and crop them down and make them fit. Like we all start somewhere, and so could you put that in there to make it a starting point and you know iterate on it as you go, right? That speaks to doing the best that you can with what you have. And especially if you're starting out, there are ways that you can I'm trying to think of the right word. There are ways that you can improve the quality or how it looks, the actual result of something without, you know, breaking the bank to do it. You know, there are exactly you can as you said using powerpoint and taking a screenshot and, and cropping it down that sounds a bit like oh that's a bit like sort of bootstrapping but i bet the quality doesn't look like it is so it's like bootstrapping high quality content and now there's so many tools out there too. I mean, like if you want to create images, you have things like Canva or other programs that are so, you know, inexpensive or free and you can create beautiful things. But basically like, I mean, the options are out there and you can find them. It's just, do you want to invest the time? And so when you go back to that other thing is how do you not get bogged down? I would also say like, you know, maybe you need to get a little bogged down. Like, I have an original goal when I started creating content of writing three times per week, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, putting it out there. Um, but, I, you know, this was back t 10 years ago. So people didn't put pictures and stuff in their articles. And like, it was just a very different time on the internet, right? Um, so today, maybe I would only do twice a week, right? And I would really spend a, an extra day or so really make sure you're polishing it. But I would say get consistent as well. And that helps you build a routine and the routine will help you create the better content and it just kind of perpetuates itself. What are your thoughts on quality versus quantity and match? Because you mentioned, you know, be consistent and that will gradually, you'll get better just through repetition sometimes. You know, if you do five pieces of content a day, instead of one, will you progress five times faster? To a, as long as you learn, yeah. you know, you don't do bad stuff and just keep plugging away. If you've got this tendency to improve things as you go, then you probably will. And the repetition will improve. But then where do you sit on potentially spending more time on the content and posting less often, but each one is is better because you're spending the time? <laughs> So what are your thoughts? I mean, there's that? definitely a balancing act, right? Um, but I do kind of think Gary V has been talking a lot about this lately. And I'm sure your audience is familiar with him, but, you know, quality is subjective in a way, right? In terms of someone might like it, someone might not like it, right? That's just the fact of life. But I do think there's a baseline level of quality you need to hit. And like I said, a quick research of your industry or your niche will show you what everyone else is doing. And so as long as you're meeting the bar or exceeding the bar, 
then it's a question of how much quantity you can put out there. And you have to do it consistently, right? Like, I think the other thing that happens to a lot of people is like you said, they're going to put out like 10 pieces of content, but then it's like quiet and crickets. And then maybe there's another one that comes out and then crickets. I think consistency is the other key because let's just say someone actually really likes what you put out. So then you have this person that's ready to like read the next thing and the next thing doesn't come. Right. So like, you know, you need to have a consistent content schedule as well in whatever medium it is. And whether that's once a week, twice a week, three times a week, like you need to get in that habit because, you know, if you do have an article or a piece of content that resonates, you know, you're going to get a subscriber or a follower and then they're going to wait for the next thing. If the next thing never comes or if the next thing comes like so far down the road and then they're like, who's this person again? Like, why, are, why is this in my feed? Like they'll forget about you. So you need to but do it consistently at a, a decent quality level. It's interesting that you bring up like, who is this guy? He's not, I'm not seen him for ages. Yep. I think that sometimes we can forget about that. We can forget about the people that need to hear us or need to read us or need to see us. We sometimes forget about that. And what's interesting as well is you bring up consistency, even if it's once a month. Consistency is 12 a year then rather than trying to do something every day, but it actually only end up being once a week. H how do you balance those two things? Not wanting to be forgotten by people, but then if you set the standard of once a month, there's a long time between the actual content. So where, where do you draw the line? You know, it really depends on your medium and your community that you've built. You can do the once a month thing. I see a, a YouTuber, Mark Robert. He's a science YouTuber. He successfully does once a month, but he puts out one of epic video every single month. But then if you actually look, his promotion is very interesting, right? It's like a ramp up to a video, right? And so he starts on social and other things. And then, you know, there's engagement with his community, even on social media or other platforms, you know, between videos, right? So, you know, I would say that's challenging for someone starting out because you don't necessarily have a community and you're trying to build a community. So doing a once a month cadence is probably going to make it harder for you to start. Doesn't mean it's impossible, right? Um, but, you know, if you have a community and they're engaged and you're creating epic stuff, like once a month is totally fine. I would recommend for someone starting out to probably do at least once a week, if not two to three times per week. Um, because one, you need the practice. You just do right? You need twice a week, three times a week practice at creating your art. Um, part two, though, is no one's going to look at your first video. So you don't have a following yet. You need to get those ones out so that you start gaining the one or two people, you know, and then maybe you start getting some people and they'll go back and see what you got maybe. But like, you need to just put it out there and get some views and get some eyeballs on it. When you think about if you don't do it often enough, you also don't get the practice. So then if you're someone that struggles with meeting your own standards around content creation, and yet you've only got the time to do it once a month, there's a very good chance you may never actually improve. And that's it. You got to, you got to put the work in, you got to put the practice in. Like, I mean, frankly, there's no way around it unless you're doing this in your like day job, but you know, even then people don't know you on your side project for it, right? Like you got to just put in the work and you have to get it out there so that people can see your thing. Yeah, I find it interesting when, when a lot of people struggle with the whole time management thing and creating a schedule and when to put their content out. But then their go-to is always to sort of, beat around the bush a little bit when it comes to committing to it you know the they'll do it once a week and it's like well that's your level of commitment then really when you think about it if it's once a day that's seven times as committed you know mm -hmm. and it seems like you were very committed right from the outset did you ever think about all of this when you were starting did you ever think like the long term the structure the format did you go through that process yourself 
You know, no, I, I didn't really. I can tell you like in the first year and a half that I started the college investor, honestly, uh, I didn't really see any growth, any traffic because I didn't know what I was doing. I was honestly, I, I read some articles and some content online and I was trying to implement these things, but that was the extent of you know what I did from a business perspective. But about that year and a half, half mark, I actually connected in an online community. And this was back in like forum days. So it was a forum of other content creators. And that's when I started learning. So one, I started reading all this stuff was other newer content creators. And they were sharing what they were doing and their wins. And it was like eye opening. I was like, Oh, and then I started sharing and building some relationships. Um, and that's where this idea of a challenge that it was in this community that was like, if you create three pieces of content a week, uh, every week for a year, you will be successful. And we kind of did it as a group challenge um, inside this community of content creators to, you know, hit this year mark. And that's when I started really learning a lot. It was both from networking and being a part of a community, but also from this consistency in creating content all the time, three times a week. I like how you, you speak to the whole networking as well, because I know that, a lot of people think that just creating content is enough, but you did the behind the scenes work to sort of make the content work for you a little bit more. What are your thoughts on the behind the scenes stuff and what sort of did you do to sort of help propel the, the content side? Well, and that's it. I mean, networking has been the the game changer for me at multiple stages of my growth. And that was the first one of just learning and listening and that level of networking. And then, you know, continuing to have those conversations, going to conferences in person, meeting people. But, you know, what happens is, is as you network, um, not only do you get to know other people, but they know you and you can become known in your space. And that means people are more apt to share your stuff or, you know, link to you or all, all these other kind of things that are important in terms of growing your business. And I think too many people go into it with this competition mindset that like other creators in my space are competition and it's cutthroat and, you know, I can't, you know, talk to them. When in the reality is, is that most industries and most people are more than happy to share and get to know other people in their industry, right? Like you guys are typically passionate about whatever the topic is. And in the personal finance space, it's very much like that, very collaborative, um, you know, a lot of people are willing to share and talk shop and, you know, do it because, you know, also a lot of people, you know, there's so everyone needs help with money. And, you know, on the flip side, there's so many ways to go about it. Um, and just looking at content creators in the space, like there's people that take money. And we do money with a very analytical New York Times approach is, is our style at the college investor. But there's people that go at it with a comedic background, like they're taking money and making it funny and fun. There's people that do it with a religious angle. There's people that do it with a family angle. There's people that do it with a, you know, retirement old person angle or a saver, a coupon angle, or, you know, there's just so many ways that you can approach the topic. And the same is through in any vertical. And so these people really aren't quote unquote competition. Like you can collaborate, like their audience isn't probably going to be your audience. And you know, what works for them isn't going to work for you. And, and so just talking shop, getting to know people um, is extremely helpful. Um, and it makes it a better experience too, in whatever industry you're in. Do you ever find that there's a lot of different advice around investing, a lot of different advice around what's best to do, what's not best to do, all those kinds of things. And then you've got financial advice through banks and financial advice through people like yourself and the whole financial landscape, if you will, for want of a better term, can be very difficult to navigate if you don't have any baseline level of knowledge. It's almost like hiring people, right? Where if you don't know anything, you'll hire anyone that knows a little bit more than you. But if you know enough about it, you're reasonably literate if you will you can miss a lot of the pitfalls that some people may try to put you in so how would you advise people go about learning more about just how finance works before they then start to 
get the best information that they can because the better literate they are they, they tend to even navigate the space easier well i think the there, there's a lot of myths out there but i think it's important for people to remember that there's nothing um with your money that you didn't learn in first grade so it's just math it's literally just math you take money in you spend some you have some left over and hopefully that money that's left over, you put in the bank or you invest it and it grows for you. There's nothing crazy about that. So if anyone comes to you with crazy things that's beyond your first grade level you, it's probably a scam. Like literally, or they're going to take advantage of you or they're trying to sell you on it. And that's the hard part is in finance, there's a lot of money, right? And so people try to sell you things because there's a lot of money in commissions. There's a lot of money in fees and, you know, you can get taken advantage of. There's no magic bullet with this. You just literally spend less than you make and you take that difference and you invest it. And the more you can make that difference, the better off you're going to be. That's it, hands down. And if anything comes at you, like you can double your money or do this investment, it's probably not a good idea for you. Uh, investing is a long-term game. It's not sexy, does not really that fun. So if you're finding fun and sexiness and enjoyment in this and you think you have an amazing deal, you probably don't. Like, <laughs> like I don't know. And that's the hard part though in creating content in this space is because people... Our battle is against crypto pump and dump schemes. And our battle is against, uh, you know, things like that, that people get really, you know, caught up in these amazing quote unquote deals when they don't really understand what they're getting into. And, you know, it's kind of sometimes even unbrainwashing people. And so it's hard because the true path to wealth uh, is just basic math. Um, but people never want that. Just like in anything, even in... in creating content and starting a business. Everyone wants the shortcut. Everyone wants the quick way to success. And, and there's no quick way to success. Really, like it takes a little bit of work, a little bit of effort, organization and planning. And uh, and then it takes time. And, you know, that's the, that's the thing with investing is it takes time and people don't necessarily want to put the time in. They find themselves getting in trouble, right? Yeah, I completely agree. And that's why I brought up the the question really because it can be very very difficult even just to figure out where to put your money so what i thought we'd do is run through some quick fire sort of suggestions for people so we should probably add a caveat to this is that you should probably get some proper advice before you actually make decisions um but if we go sort of three levels then just for now just for people that are considering it right so let's go like less than a hundred pounds less than a thousand pounds and then less than ten thousand pounds so what would be the the best thing for people to do if as of right now they've got less than a hundred pounds to really play with honestly it's going to be totally different but go buy yourself a coffee go sit down at a desk and organize your finances and organize your calendar. And this is going to be the game changer for you. Um, 100 pounds isn't going to make a difference for you, really. But what it can do is it can be a starting point. And so when I say, let's organize your money, I want you to lay it all out. I don't, you can call it a budget if you want to call it a budget. But really, it's like, know what comes in, know what's going out, and know what you owe, and know what you own, right? And like, we can take all of that. And then you can create a plan, but the plan also involves your calendar and your time. So, and what you value as well as a big part of it. So once you know what's coming in, what's going out, you have a Delta, you have whatever the difference is. And maybe it's, there's no difference. Maybe you are spending more than you're taking in. But now when you have it all organized and laid out, you can start pulling different levers. Well, maybe we cut some expenses. Maybe I don't need to have three streaming services that I don't watch. Um, you know, and now I just saved myself 40 pounds or $40 a month, um, you know, and I can use that to invest for the future. But on the flip side, maybe you're young and single 
And, you know, you have a little bit of a delta, but you have all this time, right? You go to your day job, you go nine to five, but you're not doing a whole lot from six to 10 every single night. Well, maybe that's when you can start boosting the income side. So a lot of people are always talking about cutting expenses, cutting expenses, but you also have this whole other side of the equation, right? We're going to first grade math, but you can raise your income. And maybe you do that before work, during work. I don't know. It depends on your job, right? After work, uh, you know, you can raise your income. Or you could do a combination of both, but it all aligns to your values and what you have time for. But really, with 100 pounds or less, the goal for you should be to grow the difference between what you earn and what you spend so that you have more money to invest. Because the more you invest, the more it'll grow. And the earlier you invest, the more time you have to grow. Because I'll also tell everybody that there's only one thing working against all of us in this world, and it's time, right? We're all going to die. It's just going to happen. But on the flip side, the number one thing that works for growing your money is time. <laughs> so you need more time to grow your money, but time's working against you. So start as early as you can with as much as you can. And the goal is with 100 pounds or less, find a little bit more um, that you can invest with. Thanks for sharing that. Because I think, especially now with the pandemic, some people may not actually have a whole lot lying around. So take us through to less than a thousand. So 500 to a thousand lying around, what would the suggestion be? Yeah, I mean, same thing. Start putting it into the stock market, putting it in shares, uh, letting it compound and grow. Keep it simple, low cost index funds. Uh, you don't need to pick or choose or do anything. The real thing that's gonna make a difference is how much you can put away. Um, and as early as you possibly can put it away, right? And that's going to be the goal. So if you have it, put it away. You won't miss it. I've never met anyone in my entire life that regretted investing. You know, they've never have. It's never been a thing like, darn, I really wish I would have saved or invested a little less. Like it's, <laughs> it's just not happened. Maybe it will someday and I'll come across somebody that way, but you won't regret it. Maybe it'll hurt a little bit in the short term, but five, 10 years down the road, you're probably not going to regret it. Never had that happen. So stocks and shares. And you mentioned it doesn't really matter where, as long as obviously it's, it's doing the best that it can, right? You don't want to pick thing that's just not just not going to work no just do an index fund keep it simple and honestly it's not going to make a difference which one you pick because even at a thousand dollars a thousand pounds you don't have enough to change it it's going to take more time you know you don't need to get seduced by these advisors or anything you could do it yourself find the low cost index funds a total world stock market fund you know just let it go yeah, you know, it, again, you know, even if you doubled your money and had an amazing run, you went from a thousand to two thousand dollars, not going to change your life. The thing that's going to change your life is can you put five hundred dollars consistently into the account every single month? That makes perfect sense. Okay, so swiftly on. 7,500 to 10,000. So, it's the same thing. Just keep investing it, put it into stocks and shares, letting it go. Uh, again, it sounds like a lot of money. It really does, but it's not. It's not going to change your life. You couldn't live off that for one year. You couldn't live off that for maybe more than one or two months, right? You just need to keep putting it in there and letting it grow because what happens is, is it's going to grow over time, you know, and that, let's just say it's 10,000. That's going to turn into 36 to 40,000 pounds over 20 years. It will just letting it grow. That's what it's going to happen to. And now if you did 10,000 this year and then you did 10,000 next year. And so now in 20 years, you got another 36 and then, you know, you do it again and again. Now you can see where it's going to make a big difference to your life when you're looking to do something different. But, you know, up front, it's not going to change your life. But if you continue to do this routinely and as much as you possibly can, as early as you can, it'll give you more options later in life. So at what point does the suggestion change? I know the the baseline advice is put it away as early as you can, as much as you can, and you'll reap the, the compound benefit rewards, right? the compound interest rewards. But at what point does the, the whole game change? Well, it comes, it changes when you're looking at do different assets. So you really, when it comes to investing, there's three main things you can invest in, right? Stocks and shares, real estate, 
or a business. And now when I say a business, I don't mean like stocks and shares. I mean like a business directly. It could be your own business or you could be a partnership or something like that. You know, buying a subway. I don't know. Right. Like those are really the three types of investments that there are. And, you know, the thing is stocks and shares don't really have a minimum. You can do that with small amounts of money, but when you want to start looking at real estate or buying a business, it requires a significant amount of capital to get started. And you could also argue that those are both quote unquote jobs as well. Like you're not just passively investing your money. So one, it might never change for you because that might not be what you want in your life, what you value. You don't want to spend the time necessarily dealing with tenants, right? But, you know, real estate's a great path to wealth as well. Business ownership is as well. Um, but they require time, effort, um, and definitely a little bit more capital uh, to get started. So as you get more, you can assess if that's for you. Do you want to buy a, a duplex and maybe rent one out, uh, half of it out, and then, you know, you have half. But, you know, it's it's also a lifestyle. And it's a choice that you have you you have to make for yourself if that's what you want or not. So most of the the changes in the suggestions come from the initial outlet because you mentioned like real estate if you're buying something you need to have the capital to be able to do it if you're starting a business and you want to grow it sort of beyond startup or lifestyle level that's going to take investment as well so a lot of it comes down to how much do you have to play with initially to get things off the ground it does. And it definitely varies by location. Like here in the United States, if you're in the Midwest, you might be able to get a nice investment property for, you know, $100,000, which means you only need about 10, 10%, 15% down. So ten fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, still a significant outlay, but you know, it's a starting point, right? And you can, you can buy that. Um, and when I'm talking about business investment, I'm not talking about your business because that's a very different thing. Uh, I'm talking about like, if you wanted to be an investor in a startup, an investor in a business. So again, it's passive, but you know, if, if these businesses, they're looking for someone to write a hundred thousand dollar check, they're not looking for someone to, you know, put in $2,000. They, they, they're wanting someone that can actually help scale that business. Right. That makes sense, actually, because it comes down to how much you can benefit the company that you're investing in. So a lot of people become advisors as well as investors, and they've got a vested interest in making sure that the business does really well. So as you said, it comes down to what you want to do, what your lifestyle choices are, and sort of go from there, right? It does. And I, you don't dismiss the stocks and shares because like, honestly, it's a great path to wealth and it doesn't require all this extra time and energy and all that other stuff. Just put the money in the account, watch it grow. You know, you're going to be fine. It'll, it'll do its thing over the long term. And remember, long term is 20 years. It's not like an overnight thing because I get that a lot, especially with young people is, you know, I put a thousand in and it grew 10%. Now I have 1100. That hundred dollars doesn't really feel great. And I'm like, it grew 10%. That's amazing. You didn't do anything. You just sat on your butt all day. Like enjoy that your money is growing. And that's the hard part is it's just not sexy because, you know, you have the same thing as you have these outliers where someone, you know, put a thousand dollars in Bitcoin in 2014 and now they're a millionaire, right? Like it's hard to fight that, but I'm like, you know, you didn't have any idea what Bitcoin was in 2014. So don't, you can't rewind the clock. You can't go do all these things. You know, I also like to tell people that, you know, we have the lottery here in America and a thousand people become millionaires playing the lottery every year. Does that mean that you should go out and buy lottery tickets in bulk? I mean, I don't know, like you could, I don't know if it's going to really be helpful, but I'm sure someone's done it and someone's been successful at it, but that doesn't mean you will, right? That's a very, it's a very interesting point. Just because someone wins a lottery, so you're going to spend all your money on lottery tickets and hope that you're the next one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I honestly do. I, I also like to say, like, you probably won't lose it all. You'll probably win some of the small amounts, but you probably won't be a millionaire out of it. I don't know. So let's talk resources then. Aside from a college investor, which I advise everyone listening, go and check out. How can we get started in terms of possibly like websites, apps, 
best systems to use for things like the stocks and shares that if someone wanted to get started but they don't know what websites to use i mean the amount of like bitcoin mining people that tried to contact me and i've got no idea what system to actually use because they've all got an interest in you using this right so what where do people go honestly so i love this because you know you are thrown a lot of stuff so for whatever it is you're looking to do, seriously, Google it. Like, I'm not trying to like dismiss the fact that there's things out there, but honestly, if you Google something, look at the top five pages, the top five pages of anything. How do I mine crypto? How do I start investing in stocks and shares? How do I do this? You will get uh, really good results that are like handcrafted by Google's AI that's probably some of the smartest machine learning on the planet. And if you literally take all the top ones and look at what people are saying, you'll probably see a common trend. Most of those top websites are probably going to give you five or six tools or resources, and they're probably vetted. Yeah, some of them might make money off of you, but if you're seeing the same thing across every website, chances are it's a pretty good thing to get started with. You know, I, when it comes to stocks and shares, a low cost brokerage is where you start. Low cost, no fees. Do not go to an advisor to do this if you have less than 500,000 pounds, $500,000. Don't do it. Just go and literally put it in and do it yourself. I promise you with five minutes of Googling and maybe watching a YouTube video, you can figure this out without paying someone absorbent amounts of money. Right. Uh, And the same is true with anything, Uh, you know, starting a website, man. I mean, you know this, I fell for one of these things. That's how I started the college investor. I read someone's blog, how to start a website. Like I literally followed it step by step. I remember this because I was in college and I literally went to their hosting provider. I just literally followed it step by step. You can find this out there. Like, I think that's one of the things that really irks me a little bit when it comes to like people and they say, I don't know where to start. I don't know what tools to use, yada, yada, yada. I'm a big believer in personal accountability. And if you want something, you need to be accountable to yourself to just go do it. Like literally, you've never thought about typing it into Google or typing into YouTube search and just seeing what people say. Like, I don't know, like you can do this. Like, why, what are you waiting for? If you can't do that, like whatever I tell you on this show or on my blog or anything isn't going to make a difference. Like you got to take that a little bit of a step to find it out. A very good point. I mean, we're, we're talking reasonably basic stuff on the show. Um, I'm aware that you do go a lot deeper on on your blog as well. If people want the the nitty gritty side, and what surprises me is people want the nitty gritty without being proactive first. Because if if you can't act on the basics, I mean, I've I, I've tried. I was trying acting on nitty gritty stuff straight away and I've got no chance because I don't understand the basic principles or anything. So sometimes like my desire to know as much as I can about something is exactly what stops me from actually taking action and, and getting some results. So I totally understand what you're saying. And I think being proactive somewhat, you know, doing some work off your own steam, if you will, will stand you in better stead anyway, because you you learn more from the mistakes that you make. Exactly. And and that's it. Like, you know, there is that information overload and whatnot. But honestly, it also, I think, really can be helpful to some people because like if you've gotten all this information and you still can't make a decision, maybe this isn't the right thing for you. Maybe there's something else or another avenue that's best applied. Like if you've read everything about starting a podcast and you still haven't pulled the trigger on starting a podcast, maybe you shouldn't start a podcast. Like maybe this isn't your jam. Maybe you should start a YouTube channel. Maybe you should start a blog. Maybe you should do something different, right? Like that is more aligned with it because maybe there's something that's just not native to you. You're like pushing yourself down this path. Um, so I think that's important too. I think when it comes to money, like you might not feel like investing is right for you, but you that one, I'm like, you just need to do it. Even if you put your money in a savings account, like you've got to at least save, put some away. Like I can't help you there, but like, you know, your wallet's going to thank you for it when you're 45 or 50 and you know, you, you, don't have, you have something saved up. I think that's going to be important for you. Coming at this from leaving no stone unturned. So we can talk content, we can talk building an audience, we can talk finance, 
if there was something after this that you would look back and go, oh, I wish we had the chance to, to talk about that. I wish we had the chance to really shine a light on this thing. What would that be? Man, I don't know. We covered so much. I, I mean, and you even let me just rant on accountability, but I think, and that that's really the, the biggest thing for me is, you know, be accountable. Uh, everything is possible, whether it's your money or starting a side business or growing your income, whatever it is, you can do it. Uh, I always like to use the phrase, show me your time, show me your money, and I'll show you what you value. And so for so many people, you know, they say they want these things. They say they want to do these things. But then when you look at what they're spending their time on and or what they're spending their money on, it doesn't line up. So I think a quick little exercise for anyone listening is just look at your calendar look at your budget you're expending every month and does it align with your own value system? Like if you say that family is the number one most important thing, when I look at your calendar as a stranger, would I feel that or would I not feel that, right? If you say you're struggling to get ahead and I look at your budget and your calendar and you know I look at what you're spending your money on and what you're spending your time on, would I think that you know getting ahead and getting out of debt or whatever it is, is what you're working on. Um, And so I think that those are really important to me. And I think, you know, it's a quick little exercise, but it's eye opening if you really come into it, um, you know, honestly, and you're you're being honest with yourself about it. How do you spend your time? How do you spend your money? It's very, very eloquently broken down, to be perfectly honest with you. And I think sometimes people can really struggle when they when they look at it when they look at where they're spending their time where they're spending their money they're probably not going to be happy with what they find unless they've ever done this in the past I know I have the first time I did it I wasn't happy with the results but now I am so there's a real sense of the awareness exercise can be can be um negative at first but that's the whole point right the whole point is that you go away and you do something about it so how can we find out about the college investor how can we find out about you yeah so you can go check us out at the collegeinvestor.com pretty much anything related to money topics you can also listen to the college investor audio show on your favorite podcasting platform and of course we have a youtube channel as well the college investor so however you like to consume your content we got something for you Awesome, Robert. Well, thanks again. Really enjoyed having you on the show and I look forward to keeping in touch. For those that are new to the show, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And if you enjoyed the show, feel free to share it, tag your friends that need some additional financial or content creation advice.